Here it is. Number four, you have got to give up. <laughs> Pastor Stephen, are you messing with my head? No. It may seem crazy or even like the ultimate contradiction to follow God's counsel and live the don't give up life. You must, you must give up. Plain and simple. Here's what I'm talking about. You will have to give up. So here's a short list, some examples of what I'm talking about. You're going to have to give up some of your thinking. Is it possible that some of your thinking is at odds with God's great thinking, his great plans for you? The ability to surrender your ideas for God's plans is a superpower. It's called humility. You know what else? You're going to have to give up some of your definitions. Most people have inherited pictures of things like love, family, truth, faith, that are completely wrong and out of touch with God's absolutes. You're going to have to give up a lot of your supposed meanings and definitions. Yep, your truth just got swallowed up and thrown out the window for God's truth. You've got to give it up. You're going to have to give up some of your habits. Better habits need room to breathe, to grow, to flourish. You'll need to take out the trash, and that means giving up some of those old habits that just don't work for your great destiny. You're going to have to give up some of your friends. Yes, I've got a whole series on this, but most people call certain individuals friends that God would never allow or qualify for your destiny. So you're going to have to give up or you're going to stay stuck. Here's another thing you're going to have to give up. Some and possibly many of your opinions. Did you know that God gives us spiritual weapons that he calls ultra mighty just so that we can tear down arrogant thoughts and opinions in our head, thinking that's in the way of truly knowing God? Yes, you'll have to give up many opinions and worldly perceptions that just don't align with God's heavenly great thinking for you. Woo! You must give up. Here's another one your desire to avenge yourself. Many people layer dangerous false beliefs over their heart in a time of great crisis, temptation, affliction. There's a story of a huge snake that was slithering across a workshop floor when it passed over a saw blade. It nicked the snake and the snake interpreted it as an, a violation, a cut worth countering. So the snake went on the attack and began wrapping itself around the saw blade, squeezing to instinctively use its strength to defeat the offender. Squeezing harder and harder, the deeper the blade cut, drawing more and more blood. The snake intensified its counteroffensive only to squeeze the blade so deep into its body in one last attack, it brought its own death on. Listen to me. Give up trying to avenge or revenge yourself, trying to right other people's wrongs. You just focus on you and let God save and work in your life. We know that vengeance belongs to the Lord, so give it up. Leave it alone. You must give this up. Here's another thing that you're going to have to give up, the futile task of insulating people from consequences. Let Jesus be the Savior, and you focus on obeying him. You're not a replacement for Christ. Yes, he lives in you, but we're each part of the body of Christ, not the entire package. You don't have that responsibility. God gives different gifts to different agents in his body. Don't give wisdom where it's not wanted. I know that's very hard for some of you, but stop it. Like in the story Jesus tells about the prodigal son in Luke 15, don't insulate people from their turn in the pig pen. Some people who won't listen to wisdom will listen to the pigs. The desired outcome is really ultimately to bring them back to Father God and His love. But if you're in the way trying to insulate people from consequences, you could promote what the book of Proverbs describes as even worse wounds, worse pain. Look at Proverbs 19.19. 19. A man of great anger shall suffer the penalty, for if you deliver him from the consequences, he will feel free to cause you to do it again. There's another similar um, proverb in 23, verse 35. It says, they struck me, but I wasn't hurt. They beat me, but I didn't feel it. When will I wake? I will seek more alcohol, more wine. Is that what you want for your kids, for your father, for your mother, for your nephew or your niece? 
will then give up the misguided pursuit of insulating people from their consequence and instead give that $100 to a single mom raising her kids to serve Jesus. Here's another thing you're going to have to give up. Some of your generational traditions. Ooh, this is a sticky one. Save yourself. If Jesus had to die to get Father God's blood transferred into your life and my life, why in the world are you insisting on championing your own genetic bloodline? Give it up. There's only room for one bloodline in your life, and if it's not Jesus' blood, then what will you say when you stand before God in the great judgment? Trust me, nobody's going to stand before God claiming English blood or Spanish blood or Greek or African or Chinese or Italian blood. It'll be, I claim the blood of Jesus. That's where our confidence is. Let me give you just one more example of stuff that, you know, we're going to have to give up. Give up the pursuit of equity. God is a God of justice, righteousness. Don't chase a weak social hand-me-down invented by humanistic thinkers who are only trying to contrive a fairness substitute for the reality of God's goodness. Don't devote your life to chasing less at the expense of more. Martin Luther King dropped the mic, so to speak, when he said this. This is an amazing quote. He said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. What an amazing statement. And that's not some counterfeit equity he's talking about. It's a true measurement based on genuine character and not the optics meritocracy and not social engineering. Joseph in the book of Genesis was a slave and became a leader of the known world with God's help. Ruth was an impoverished immigrant and she became the matriarch of one of the wealthiest influential families in Israel. She became the great grandmother of kings, even Jesus. Equity doesn't do it, my friend. God's justice and favor does it. So give up on less so that you don't give up on more. Now, of course, there are probably many give up items that you can think of and some the Holy Spirit is bringing up in your mind right now. But what I want you to understand is this, to live the don't give up life, a tenacious, victorious life, you'll have to let go of weights, distractions, and yes, sin that hinders you from running the race set before you. That's all in Romans 12 verse 1. All of life responds to focus. Focus is the elimination of options. I've shared this example for 20 years. A 100-watt light bulb can barely light up a decent-sized room at night. A 100-watt laser can cut through six inches of steel. You can waste your energy in life with a minimal outcome, or you can focus the light God gives you and cut through any and all obstacles. Focus in this context means to give up the stuff that you're not assigned to so that you can truly live the don't give up life. God's calling you right now. Advancing is far more fulfilling than novelty. Can I say that again? Advancing is far more fulfilling than novelty. The old adage, curiosity killed the cat, it has merit. We're being seduced by the instant gratification of swiping up, down, left, and right, or who knows what, and there's no true progress. Only an unfocused hit of dopamine. Great outcomes in life absolutely require giving up, elimination, focus. You can't do everything, be everything, and have everything when God has strategically assigned you to live life strong. He's got an assignment for you. Strength requires elimination and focus. Look what Paul the Apostle talks about helping us to understand our role in the family of God in the body of Christ. He gives us this picture that's all about focus, not being a generalist, but a specialist. This speaks to just how intentional God is about who you are and what you're called to. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 17 to 19, and then we'll skip to verse 27. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God has placed and arranged the limbs and the organs in the body, each particular one of them, just as he wished and saw fit and with the best adaption. But if the whole were all a single organ, 
where would the body be? Well, that would be just a monster, right? Now skip down to verse 27. Now you collectively are Christ's body and individually you are members of it, each part severally and distinct, each with his own place and function. This brings up one of the greatest tragedies of the Christian church today. Too many good people have been pressured to fill a role that they're not made for. Imagine me trying to force my nose to do what my eye is assigned to do. Or what if I insisted on my hand trying to take the place of my foot? I guess the upside is I'd never stub my toe again, but I'd never walk, never run. I'd never play guitar ever again because my hand would always have a boot or a shoe on it. We can laugh at that absurd picture of this, but tragically, many good people live exactly like this, doing good things they're not called to or gifted for. They live discouraged lives, chasing something that they don't even really want. Give up. If, that's, if this is you, give up. Don't be called to be an eye trying to get a glove to fit you. Focus. Give up to excel at what God's assigned for your life. So how do you stop great vision? Someone once asked the question, how do you stop a person with great vision? The answer, you give them another vision. You see, that creates die vision, division. Two visions pulling you apart from the inside out, going in separate directions. You've just become double-minded. That's what James calls it. The enemy is a trickster. When you're a child of God, he can't stop you, but he works to get you to stop you. All these give up things that you allow, that you tolerate, they become like holes in your boat of your don't ever give up dream. What you tolerate, my friend, you can never change. You might justify one little give up hole as being something that could never sink your ship, but let's face it, you begin to justify one after another after another because by themselves, hey, it's not just that big of a deal. But listen to what King Solomon said. He said, the little foxes spoil the whole vineyard. The Lord Jesus warned, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. My friend, the little things destroy you. They can destroy you. Your don't give up is being compromised by what you know you should give up. The problem isn't your destiny. God has always had a great destiny for you. And the problem isn't your don't give up power. You are an overcomer. The problem is the give up stuff weighing you down, dragging you around, that's pulling you off course and detouring your destiny. As the saying goes, the longest distance between any two points is a shortcut. Shortcuts are compromises. Give up stuff interfering with your don't give up faith and power. So what should we do? Oh, what should we do? I'm glad you asked. Let's take a page out of God's friend Abraham's playbook. You know, the father of faith, as he's so well known. Abraham's faith made way for the seed of heaven to come to earth in the form of a baby born of a virgin, be crucified 33 years later for our sin. And here it is for God to be able to raise up his son from the grave three days later as the king of kings, our savior, Jesus. So in answer to your question of what should we do, check out this Abrahamic, how to dose of don't give up medicine and see the outcome of this faith action item. Romans 4 verses 18 to 20. For Abraham, human reason for hope being gone, hoped in faith that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been promised, so shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered the utter impotence of his own body, which was as good as dead because he was about a hundred years old or the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief or distrust made him waver, doubtingly questioned concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong and was empowered by faith as he gave praise and glory to God. Did you hear that? Abraham grew strong. He was empowered by faith. How? He gave praise and glory to God. Here was this old man with his old wife who had never had children believing God that they were going to get the promise, which was many nations, a child, and have many nations in their lineage over and over through the discouraging times. Every birthday, every birthday as he got older, as his wife got older, and they had no child, no promise yet, Abraham kept on giving God praise and glory for delivering on the promise. 
Give up magnifying the problem. Give up exalting the bad things, the lack, the way you feel. That's right. Stop using your words to advertise how you feel and pull off Father Abraham. Grow stronger and stronger, empowered by faith as you give praise and glory to God. Sometimes I imagine Abraham, he was, you know, full white hair, gray hair. And as he began to praise and glorify God, I saw his sideburns started getting a little bit darker and his hair, his, some of his friends and the family and the, the people People, his employees around him were like, didn't Abraham's hair used to be totally white? Oh my goodness. Now he's getting these black streaks in it. He's getting black streaks in his hair. What's happened to his wife? She's like 90 years old. How come she looks like she's 25? What is going on? I'll tell you what was going on. They were praising and glorifying God. God has great things for you, but it will require, it always requires a don't give up patient perseverance. And we just learned that requires you giving up all the other stuff, all the other weights and junk. Right now, you decide to give up whatever is distracting you, whatever is urgently requiring your essential text, your swipe, and your ultra urgent inbox message. Do like Abraham. Give praise and glory to God right now. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. We pray and believe that God's Word is guiding your life and your future from this moment on. Thank you for your generous support. Together, we're getting God's good news to others. Sign up today for the free Today's Life Talk, an encouraging gift from Pastor Stephen. He sends directly to your email. At Living Room Church, you are loved, and we pray blessings on you. Remember, Jesus is Lord, and in Him, we can live life strong.